good morning, George, and I am in Detroit, Michigan, and it's right airport today, and we have a phenomenal guest, another Michigander from the University of Michigan. Yes, today we have Dr. Molly O'Shea, and the topic of discussion is going to be an interesting one, personalized medicine in Michigan. That should never be And interesting, the podcast always goes on. It doesn't matter. The show must go on. We've done it from the beach. We're doing it from the airport right now. The show must go on. That's great. Do I love it. Do Dr. Molly has over 30 years of experience as a pediatrician and owner of a holistic and family-centered pediatric practice. She's passionate about providing comprehensive and personalized care for children with rare and treatable diseases and empowering parents with education and support. She has a strong background in genomics, pediatrics, and entrepreneurship. Molly, it's great to see you again. We always ask, we always ask all of our guests, why did you become a pediatrician? I think that's an interesting question. I bet you get a lot of different answers uh, to that one. But I knew from a pretty young age that I wanted to be a doctor. That was for sure. I was, when I was a kid, I was definitely not a typical girl kid. I didn't want to play with dolls. I wasn't a dress wearer, none of that kind of stuff. It just wasn't me. I was a tomboy all the way. No one in my family was in medicine, so there was no role model there. But I definitely wanted to understand how everything worked in the human body and was curious from day one. And I think my parents shut me up and to basically just get me out of their hair would provide me some information about how the body worked and give me, let me read stuff that looking back was probably ahead of my age, but it was definitely, I ate it up. So by the time I was 11 or 12, I knew I wanted to be a doctor and I was playing boys little league my whole childhood. They, they had to sue the city to let me play. It was definitely, I was going to be that girl who was like going to show the guys girls can beat these doctors. And there was a moment when I was shopping with my mom. It was actually for my confirmation dress. I'm a I'm Catholic, grew up Catholic in this traditional way. And the woman at the local department store, I was looking at, and, and I wasn't in love with wearing dresses, but I understood this was an important time to wear a dress. And it was not like I was going to be a stinker about it or anything. And I was looking at dresses and I gravitated toward expensive dresses for whatever reason. And the salesperson said to me, oh, honey, you better make sure that you find a rich husband when you grow up. And this was like, I don't know, 77 or something, 1977. I said, I don't need to do that. I'm going to be a doctor. I'll be able to afford whatever I want myself. And that was really when it crystallized for me that I was going to be a doctor. And becoming a pediatrician then was when I was in medical school. I actually got admitted to a program right out of high school that was a combined medical school undergrad program. Didn't have to go through the whole competitive beat each other up undergrad experience. I was already admitted to medical school out of high school and at Michigan. And so I had the luxury of enjoying my undergraduate experience in a different way. I majored in psychology as an undergraduate student and could really explore life that way. And in my rotations in medical school, I realized that I was curious about a lot of different aspects of medicine. But when it came to understanding who are my people, like which doctors really are my people, pediatricians were the people I wanted to hang out with. They, you know, were the people who were most attractive to me personality-wise. And I do not regret one minute my decision to enter pediatrics, both for the types of patients that I care for regularly and the colleagues that I get to interact with throughout my career. I have to ask, I wonder what role your two brothers played mm. in your tomboyish strong character. Yeah, I was the oldest in my family, and they certainly were very different, my brothers and I, just by our natures. 
I had one very sports-oriented brother, and I have another brother who is very creative and brilliant-minded, not sportsy at all. We're very strong personalities, all three of us. Don't try to get in an argument with any of us. Like, we'll talk you down forever. Like, you will never, we'll never stop talking. And we are, but we're also just passionately attached to one another in this beautiful way. And we had a difficult childhood. Our parents were challenged to to live with in, in lots of ways. My mom had type 1 diabetes and was very, very sick quite a bit throughout her childhood, was absent um, because of her illness in a lot of ways. My dad was on a very, he was the dean of the business school at Wayne and uh, spent a lot of time um, focused on his academic demands. Uh, so it was, we were fending for ourselves a lot as kids. And I think that created a sort of grit and um, tenacity that we that we share and live with even now. It also, though, created difficulties. I think it it is part of the reason I became a pediatrician. I didn't want other, I wanted to help other kids and families um, avoid some of the difficulties that my brothers and I uh, experienced. Do you think that made you stronger as a person? It did for me. I don't think it did for my brothers. Uh, they both um, had some difficulties. They're both um, recovered alcoholics, have been sober for many years now, but it definitely created real struggles for them. For me, it, I, I think because I was the oldest, because I took on the mantle of responsibility in a way that was natural for me because of my birth order, I, I became a responsible person at a very young age and carried that with comfortably in a way that also set me up to be creative-minded from an entrepreneurial standpoint and also unafraid to take chances and to do things a little differently. So, so there's some, thanks for sharing all of this. This, this is yes. a wonderful story, um, but so much to unpack, right? So I always say that autoimmune diabetes affects the whole community. It doesn't affect just the individual that has to live with it. It affects the siblings, the parents, the school bus driver, the teacher, the counselor at the camp. Everybody has to be aware of what's going on with this one child or adult who needs to monitor their life 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's a tremendous burden on our society. The other thing is the whole topic of resiliency, how some people experience tremendous trauma or ACEs or whatever you want to call them in the modern language, yet they figure a way to be resilient or what the psychiatrists call do post-traumatic growth and excel, not just succeed, but like you have excelled. And then the whole topic of allowing people to be who they are, you are a very strong character dressing like a tomboy, but no one said you're a boy. You're just a strong character. And you led your life the way you wanted to live, live, live it, right? And that, I think, should be the way it is, right? But I do, do hope, I do wish that we could figure out what's the secret sauce that makes somebody do post-traumatic growth and go beyond what they were meant to achieve. Yeah, I'm very interested in that as well, I think, in part because of my own personal experience. And I know the data suggests that if you have even one person who provides that positive connection and safe safety net for a child who is experiencing adverse childhood events, that you can have um, better outcomes, protectors, essentially, and not necessarily protectors from the trauma, but emotional protectors who provide that cushion. And, and I did have someone who provided that for me. It was my grandmother, my dad's mom, who had, was a widow relatively young and ended up spending a lot of time in our house. And she definitely provided that, that cushion for me, I think, that allowed not only for my own 
confidence just to be myself. And times were different then too. It was the late 60s and early, it was the early 70s, I guess, at that point. And people were freer, I think, in ways without as much policing of of all the things, right? It was like, it was the early 70s. So it was the hippie, free love, be yourself, like all is okay. And without as much of the crackdown that we're seeing today around people who also want to be themselves, but there's a lot of fear around that. And I was fortunate, even though I was in a very conservative community growing up, that, and that's why my family sued to have me be allowed to play on the boys' teams. I was a very good athlete. And so once I was allowed to play, they didn't mind it so much because it was, I was good at it. But, but it was, it was, I had a protector in my grandmother. And that made a big difference, I think, for me. My, I've had the, I've had other, extraordinarily adverse events. I've lost a child. And that was a, an incredible, huge loss that, that I think had I not had my own childhood difficulties could have really been even more difficult to recover from. So I agree with you. Resiliency is something that understanding what are the elements that provide the opportunity for that comeback story are sometimes nebulous and hard to figure out. But if we could figure out what that secret sauce is or what are the elements that create that, we could empower families differently as, or foster families or adoptive families differently as children move forward through loss or adversity. Yeah, so I, I think that you can figure that one out, and it's in the school system. And they wrote a book about that. I don't think it's called The Resilient Child, but it's something like that. It's Marty Seligman and one of his core researchers. And they've done that in the military, too. They can teach a military how to, I guess, train or educate people. So that when they experience on, on godly events and they watch these, they see these things that you can never get out of your head. They don't go into PTSD, but we haven't adopted that as a society in our school systems. I don't know. I never understood why. And then I just have a funny comment. So you wanted to buy all the dresses you want and you went to pediatrics. Yeah. But... <laughs> That's not where the money is. <laughs> no, that is too That's a good point, clearly. And I don't really like dresses anyway. So it's all worked out fine for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. I guess money wasn't really my driver, apparently. Not really. Not it, apparently. You it know. just stuck in my craw, the idea that I was going to have to hook my train to some rich guy. Yeah. I mean, no, was, I, I, I agree with you. No and, way. Uh, and and I'm, I'm sorry about your loss. Of, uh, was Thanks. it a son or a daughter? It was a son. I, it was about five and a half years ago. I'm so sorry. Thank I, you. There are no words to it. There are no words. I wanted to ask you a little bit about your practice right now. You started this practice as an interesting name, right? Bring the Pediatrics and Wellness Center. Mm -hmm. The name, I think, says a lot. Could you describe your practice for our listeners? Yeah. I had been a managing partner in a big traditional practice with many physicians, two locations, all the thing for about 15 years. And there came a point where I wanted to do things a bit differently. It was uh, like 2000 and 2009 when I began to hatch this cockamamie scheme uh, because we were seeing so many more kids with autism and other neurodiverse profiles. And we, I was struggling seeing them in the office to really get any sense of who they really are as people. So I talked to my partners at the time and said, I'd like to begin to do some house calls. I'd like to see them in their natural environment. And it was also the time when vaccine hesitancy was really present because the Wakefield study had come out, but had not yet been debunked. There was a lot of drama. There's a lot of drama there. So there were several things. I wanted a closer relationship with families I wanted to see families in their natural state. I wanted to provide my email address and give my cell phone to families so that as 
situations arose, we had a direct connection at the time. My, my big practice was using a nurse call system at the, in the evenings and on the weekends to re- relieve that burden. But I was convinced that by creating a closer connection with families, we would actually reduce the burden of call because it, if families understood they could get a hold of us anytime they needed us, they would actually need us less. They would feel more, I don't know, empowered with that safety net and be confident of it and not feel as needy in that way around. And I also understood that the kind of advice we could give could be more robust in that, in that, connect, in that connection. My partners, no, no surprise, were not interested in that sort of relationship at the time. So I left, I started my own practice, structured things very differently. I created exam rooms that had no tables. They all had couches and like little lounge chairs so that people felt like they were in a living room space. There was never a waiting room in my office and hasn't been ever since. And it was concierge-like without a concierge fee because concierge didn't really exist in the way it does now back then. And we did, I did newborn home visits and all of that. And also, I was very open to complementary and alternative approaches that had evidence base. Okay. So, if something was, if we knew safety profile, I would say, but we didn't have good evidence for it. I would say, look, I know it's safe. I don't know if it's effective. You can go ahead. If I, if we had evidence that it was unsafe, I would say, no way, Jose. If it was safe and effective, I would actually recommend it. And so, we, we had, I had this whole, approach that was long before migraine treatments involved coenzyme Q10 and magnesium and butterbur, those were all things we were doing regularly in our office practice. It was using some of those strategies along with baby-led weaning long before that was a thing and, and introducing allergenic foods about four years before the AAP changed its mind about it. As soon as the early Israel study came out, we were, we moved. So it was using evidence to move toward um, a holistic approach. We integrated behavioral health into our practice in 2009 and had an on-site psychologist who was helping us with parenting and whole family issues, as well as very specific and targeted behavioral health issues for children of a variety of ages. So it it really was a design that now sounds very like ho-hum because this is what everybody does. But at the time, it was a very different model than was seen. How, how could you afford to do all of this? Because it be taking an hour to go visit with a newborn, there's no way that Virginia Medicaid pays $70 for a well-child exam. There's no way that you can take an hour getting to somewhere and then spending 30 minutes with the family and then coming back to the office. You, we did have a for... radius. We didn't, we did have a, we localized where we could do those home visits. So it wasn't done just free form. It had to have been within a five mile radius of the office. I tended to do them on my lunch hour, or I would do them at the beginning of the day or the end of the day, like you would do rounding. I, although I was still rounding at the hospital at the beginning, By 2015, probably, I gave up hospital rounding, so that made it a little bit easier. It took up that space, and and that's, you don't make money, little rather. How many did you do in a day? Yeah, it it would vary, right? Some days, none. Some weeks, none. We weren't a huge practice, so at the most, we had four providers at a time at an office, so we might have six newborns, five newborns a week. It wasn't heavy. And when we did have that many providers, then a person would have time blocked to do those. And then if we didn't have any that day, it would fill in with sick visits. So we, we set it up just like you do with hospital rounding. It's no different right. from a schedule standpoint. This is a very interesting model. Uh, I know this was a thing that was done more for convenience, for... It was relationship building. Yeah. Yeah, so it was, it's relationship building. It's frankly, it's a differentiator in the marketplace. There are a lot of reasons to consider doing it. Um, one, one bread and butter. 
no, you don't make money on it for sure. It's a loss leader for sure. But it definitely creates a relationship with the family that is different and stronger and allows for, I think, and we believe differently, it reduces maternal postpartum or family, not just maternal, but paternal postpartum depression and anxiety. It creates a different dynamic within the family as far as, I think, if you look at the drivers of parental stress over time, and even the Surgeon General now with the warning and, you know, alarm bells being raised about parental stress, if you really look at the drivers, it's this intense parenting that is part of the challenge, right? That parents are really focused in and in that micromanagement mindset around, I have to do everything right. I've got to do it a certain way. If I don't do this, then my child's emotional health or their their academic trajectory or whatever it is, or they reflect back on themselves and say, I'm not going to be the good parent if I haven't done X, Y, or Z. So that intensive parenting gets started really early. And I feel that pediatricians have an opportunity to reframe that for parents in those early months of life by decompressing some of that and explaining and talking through and helping parents recognize that they aren't going to screw this up. It's not that hard. It's tiring. It's really exhausting. But it's not that complicated. And that every little tiny squeak the kid makes or every little spit up that occurs is not a warning bell. It's not a giant red flag. And the more that a parent can begin to gain confidence in their own instincts, relying less and less on the internet, relying more and more on themselves, the less stressed they end up becoming and the more confident they become. And the, therefore, the more able they are as their child gets older to be less influenced by these external messages that come in around parenting and the more more able they are to just stand on their own two feet, taking in advice from trusted sources and move ahead with their parenting. So that used to be the model every parent was in, right? They had their parents around them when they were had their children at home initially or their older aunts or whoever it was gaining that confidence. And we don't have that anymore. Hmm. And so I feel like this is an opportunity for pediatricians to create that. You got this. You can do this. And by shoring up that confidence, it's important. Yeah, there's a lot to break down there. I, th I think the lack of community, the lack of our ability to have conversations with each other and bright futures has really played into this dynamic of where we have made totally normal processes that humanity had been doing for thousands of years into a very complicated formula that you need 11 years to figure out that a baby breastfeeds, poops, and pees. And if he's, he or she is doing that consistently, there's probably nothing wrong with the baby. That's exactly right. As I tell parents, if the only reason you thought something was wrong is because you opened a diaper or unsnapped a onesie, there's nothing wrong. I don't care if there's a rash. I don't care if the poop is green. If the only reason you knew it was because you opened something, your child's fine. I always, I always tell the parents when they come in, they're very nervous. Two things. I've seen where they come in with their grandmother, right? And the grandmother's engaged a little bit, but in the corner where they used to be very engaged in the past. And I tell the daughter, I said, you know what? The best Dr. Google is sitting right there. Ask her. She knows. She'll know when to worry. Yeah, she'll know when to worry. Yes. There's a lot of stuff. And I would tell her, so you know, before I had children, I'd walk into a room and they'll ask me some weird question that I have no idea. They didn't teach you this in medical school or residency. And I would ask, hey, grandma, what do you think? Is this normal? And grandma, oh, doc, doc, it's okay. Don't worry about it. And the same thing with children. I've had this repeated to me 18 years later. I always say, you know what, with children, it's pretty simple. If you feed them, they probably will grow well. Sam says, hey, doc, look, he's going to college. Look how well he grew. I fed him. 
people right. think of what we say, silly things too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Now, wh- what and why do you do a nature genomics? So I have had a long-term interest in children who are different. I think that's the best way to put it, right? So initially it started with my interest in the kids who were not neurotypical, and that was why my different practice emerged. And then over time, I was given the opportunity to work with a group of patients with rare disease who had cystinosis, and which, don't worry if you don't remember what it is, because about 500 people in the country have cystinosis, so don't sweat it. And But I was given this opportunity as a consultant to work with this group of families, and I understood how, first of all, how difficult it is to be a family or a person with such an unusual rare condition because of its isolating nature, especially a condition that is whole body affecting, where you don't necessarily, people's cystinosis can look a little different because they have growth differences over time, but you don't necessarily look all that different from the get-go. And yet, you are profoundly affected by your disease, and it influences every single aspect of your life. And at the time, I was hired to help develop a program to help adolescents and young adults transition, as they're transitioning to adulthood, remain adherent to their medication, which is life-requiring, okay? Because you know how adolescents are. They're likely to want to just say, screw this, right? They all want to go with all their medicines, pretend they don't have the stuff they have. And my my job was to help them reject maybe their parents, reject maybe whatever else they want to reject, but learn how to embrace who they are as a whole person with this chronic condition. And it was a really fun project. And it was as a result of that experience that I got some street cred in the rare disease world. Then Nurture Genomics, it's a gen, it is a genetics company. Its whole purpose is to help families and pediatricians identify children or who appear healthy and in the early years of life, identify children who are genetically predispositioned because of variations in their genome to having rare conditions. And as a result, by knowing that information, be able to take steps because the conditions that we screen for are all treatable. So for example, in the example of cystinosis, if you knew that that a child that you just had the gene, which has happened actually in the cystinosis community, you have a kid with cystinosis, your next kid is born, you do the genetic testing, right after birth, you're able to begin cysteine-depleting therapy right from the get-go. And the dramatic difference in the disease trajectory is visible. The the severity of the disease is very different. How soon kidney uh, failure occurs is years and years different. Like someone may be going for the first kidney transplant in like at age 11 when you wait to get diagnosed until you're nine to nine months to two years. Whereas if you begin cysteine depleting therapy right after birth, before symptoms appear, you might get to 20 before you would need that. So as an example, Nurture's goal is to provide that same opportunity for a whole host over 400 conditions, not all of which are as severe as cystinosis, but provide that opportunity to parents and pediatricians to so that they can take proactive steps and provide, in some cases, a complete, con, complete uh, avoidance of any symptoms arising for their child. Isn't that something like an extended metabolic screen? They're not all metabolic conditions, but, oh. but yes, it would be like that. Interesting. About 20-something years ago, 25 years ago, young Dr. Rogu was late at the hospital I walk into the room, the nurses grab me from the doorway, you gotta go see this kid. 
kid was white as a piece of paper, mm. shocky, sick. I didn't know what he was. Called 911, called the ER, said, I don't know what this kid has, but good it's not. Yeah. Sit up in the ICU, rule out sepsis, rule out seizures, rule out this, rule out that, and just would not get better. If so, they looked at the newborn spin and the newborn spin was normal. Somehow they ended up figuring it out many weeks later that the kid was having a thyrosine deficiency. Ended up a month later, she got a liver transplant at one month of age. The girl, the patient is like 20 something now. She already had her second oh, liver transplant. What an amazing story. Oh, that was a kid. You look at the newborn screen, it wasn't on the newborn screen. Mm -hmm. Second kid is born two years later. And I recognized the name. I went to the nursery and this kid was totally normal. It was already seen twice by somebody and in the hospital too. And then when I saw the name, I remembered and I went over to, to the neonatal. Oh, th that child ended up in the NICU. But nobody knew about the sister. Yeah. The neonatologist, the sister had a very turbulent manifestation of thyroid deficiency. You should check this kid out because it's not on the newborn screen. Of course, they blew me off. What do you know? And then they finally did it. And the kid was lacking in thyroid. He had thyroid deficiency also. They changed the formula and the kid's in college. And as he just has a special diet now. Yeah. It's perfectly fine. So you averted another disaster. Now they do the thyrosine in the newborn screen, but right. these kids didn't have that luxury. Yeah. It is remarkable. And I feel like the newborn screen is obviously life-saving and that, and the goal of the newborn screen is different in that it, its purpose is exactly what you've described, George, is to identify children who without intervention would have life-threatening or permanent disability if not um, discovered in the first weeks or month of life. So with the, and, and the thyroid's on there because of the um, profound um, mental impairment, uh, even though that may not appear in the first weeks of life, um, it, it definitely it would easily go missed. Um, and nurture screen is a little bit different in its goals because many of the conditions that are screened for may not appear in the first weeks of life. Some would, or first months of life, but many may not manifest symptoms until a bit later, so up to age seven, eight years old, but have profound effects and often have similar overlapping symptoms with so many other things that discovering what it is often can take three to five years because of the nature of the beast, right? If you're looking for something rare, you don't put it on the top list of things to, to look for initially. And as a result, it often takes a very long time to figure it out once these symptoms present. And as a result, time, there's missed time for treatment. So progression has occurred during that gap of the of that diagnostic journey. This episode is sponsored by our friends over at Free Day Eye Medical Scribes. Let's hear what they have to say. What if you could take the computer out of the physician-patient relationship? With Freed, you can. Freed is the AI medical scribe that listens, transcribes, and crafts perfect soap notes for you seamlessly. This isn't just another productivity tool. Freed is a life-altering solution for physicians, helping you regain the joy of practicing medicine. Freed frees you from the burden of documentation, so you can focus on what really matters, your patients. With Freed, the computer is no longer a barrier. It's a quiet assistant that works in the background, capturing every word of your patient interactions, accurately and quickly. The result? You're fully present in each visit, building stronger connections and offering more attentive care. And when the day is done, your notes are too, leaving you with more time to focus on yourself, your family, and your life outside of medicine. Freed is the solution thousands of physicians swear by to reclaim their passion for medicine. Try it free for seven days, no credit card needed. Visit getfreed.ai and rediscover what you love about being a doctor. Well, so I'm going to, we'll circle back to this topic. It's extremely interesting and you're very knowledgeable in it, but... I want to know what you do for the AAP Chicago and the AAP Michigan as far as getting the boys out. Yes. So uh, separate from nurture, because obviously the work I do for nurture, there's conflict of interest. So I don't talk about or do genetics stuff when it comes to the AAP. But for Michigan, for the Michigan chapter, what I'm working on with them is some suicide prevention 
I'm going to be doing some suicide prevention work with them starting in the new year. And they've got a grant and they're going, we're, we haven't figured out exactly what the output of that grant is going to be, but we're going to be working together to do some suicide prevention work around that. And then for the AAP National, I do several things. I'm one of their media spokespeople. So at any time, they send me a little email or text me and say, we've got a news outlet that needs a talking head to talk about X, Y, or Z. And so I'll get on the news and talk about it. I also did a TV ad campaign for them last spring or summer. I guess it aired in the summertime about the Kids Online Safety Act, which is federal legislation that is uh, around, basically around online safety, obviously. It's passed through the Senate. It is through the committee in the House and hopefully heading to the floor soon. And it its goal is to create legislative or uh, congressional requirements of the tech companies to decouple the algorithm uh, so that children and teens no longer will be automatically fed down into a rabbit hole, no matter which of the tech platforms they're on, that notifications are uh, turned off so they aren't going to be pinged all the time with notifications, and that children can erase their data um, and their profiles completely. So children still exploring who they are, figuring out their identities, can uh, experiment, explore, and then have that information completely erased. I did an ad campaign for them, and it aired over the summertime, and then went and did some advocacy work on Capitol Hill in the spring. The other hat I wear for them is I also do suicide prevention echoes for them. So I'm one of their faculty for suicide prevention echoes, and I'm an ambassador doing talks all over the country for youth, mental health, and media. So I'm an ambassador for the Social Media and Youth Mental Health Center of Excellence. Well, that's got to keep you busy. No, it does, but it's a good busy. These are all yeah. really hard time to make house calls. I do have people who work with me now, so I don't have to do quite as much in the office. I, although next month somebody's out like, getting a knee replacement, so I'll be working a lot more in the office. But so, yeah. so you mean to tell me with all these social media outlets, if you want to delete your profile, you can't? I thought you could. You do, but the data doesn't go away. It's still stored somewhere. So what this would allow is for the, for the tech companies to actually delete it. So that nobody could go back. So let's say you went on Instagram right now and you deleted your profile. You could recover it, right? And if somebody were dark webby, they could go and find it and get it. Yeah. So it has to be fully deleted in this with this legislation. So I'm also very interested in something that you said at a dinner in Michigan. Some diseases are monogenetic, some are polygenetic, and then there's variants, varying penetrants. And the two that we talked about was worms. And then you said something that even confused me more that you don't like to screen for diseases that are not monogenetic and don't have a cure. And I'm like, what do you do when you find out somebody has the genetic makeup to have worms? You kick the kidneys off? There is no cure. But you explained all of this. So what is polygenetic versus monogenetic variance penetrants? And what is the treatment in Will's tumor? Okay. So we'll start first with a little <clears throat> genetics primer for all of us like me who needed a little refresh when I started uh, my work at Nurture. I'm going to start big and come a little smaller, right? So we all have We've got our chromosomes, right? Those are the first thing. So if you try some, you have a whole extra chromosome. Uh, and chromosomes are like, if you, if you think of a library, right? Chromosomes are, it's like you've got all the things in the library. And, and then the genes are like 
the are the chromosomes are like the shelves, the big shelves um, in the library, and then each book is a gene, like a whole. Well, we'll say it's like a gene, and each letter in the book is like you like one variant in the gene. So if you have one letter written wrong in a book, you might have a variant of a gene that could cause problems or not. So that's one way to think about it. And so sometimes conditions are caused by just having one letter in one book miswritten, okay? And that's a monogenic condition where you have one gene, one, one letter in one word miswritten in one book. And that's a monogenic condition. I'm simplifying it, okay? There could be like the same condition could have one word in this book and one, or one word in this book and or one word in this book and they all give the same condition. But the idea is there's one word and one book miswritten. Polygenic conditions mean that it's not just one letter in one book. You've got to have a bunch of books with things that are miswritten before the condition can occur. In the case of diabetes, you not only have to have a bunch of books, but you also have to have something in the environment come and open the book to that page and so, to get it read. Okay? So it's, a, it's more complicated than that. Because not all books get read. It's like any old library, right? Do you think everybody reads every book in the library? Probably not. But in the case of a monogenic condition, it's a popular book. It's a hot pick in the library. So it's read all the time. Whereas in a polygenic condition, those books aren't always read. So something has to make it popular. Oprah picks those books, right? So Oprah is the thing from the outside that comes in the environmental thing that comes in and says, we're reading the book, and then it gets turned on. So polygenic things. And so I'm going to interrupt you just for a second there. Yeah. Because then is depression and obesity, are they polygenetic disorders too? Mm -hmm. And they need the environmental or community factor in order to express the phenotype? They're not only genetic, okay? So okay. obesity can come on without a genetic trigger, as can depression, okay? So depression, not all cases, of, it's like growth hormone. Not all cases of growth hormone deficiency are triggered by a genetic problem. They could be a tumor, it could be a... So not all cases of depression, can you do a whole genome sequence and find pathology there? Same is true for obesity. Not every time can you find a genetic pathology there. So in the Great. case where there is, there does it is polygenic. And I don't know the answer to your question about whether that polygenic risk demands an environmental trigger or if it just requires the alignment of the right set of genes. It, it may be certain kinds of neurodevelopmental disorders, for example, that exhibit autistic features are also multi-gene driven. So there's a difference between polygenic risk and multi-gene conditions, okay? So some conditions that develop autistic features can be monogenic, meaning you have one gene that's the problem and you end up with autistic features. Sometimes it's multiple genes involved and it results in autistic features. Sometimes it's polygenic. You have multiple genes and you need a trigger and it exhibits autistic features. So there can be a variety of scenarios. Oh, wow. That's fascinating. It's very yeah. complex, very fascinating. Yeah. So now going back to Wilms tumor, you yeah. can't cure Wilms tumor. No. Yeah, that's correct. I didn't say they were all curable. They're okay. all treatable. Okay. So in the case of Wilms tumor, if you know you have genetic risk, and this is where penetrance comes into play. So let's talk briefly about penetrance. 
and then we'll talk about management. So penetrance means that if you have if you have the typo in the book and the book's always read, basically, it's a question of is this book always read or is this book only read 70% of the time? That's penetrance. So if this book is a hot pick and there's like a lineup of people waiting to get this book out of the library, meaning that 100% of the time this book is out of the library and being read, that's 100% penetrance. If this book is sitting on the shelf unread 70% of the time, then that's 30% penetrance because it's read 30% of the time and it's sitting on the shelf 70% of the time, okay? So the genes, and, and if it's not being read, you don't have symptoms. If it's being read, you have symptoms. So nurture, use a panel of people, genetics, people from all over the country, some even from all over the world, to help. They had this elaborate rubric. I was not a part of that team because I'm a pediatrician, not a geneticist, to help determine which genes are going to be part of the screen. Because right now, there are over 700 conditions that present in early childhood that have treatments. Nurture's only screening for 413 because the rest have variable penetrance, meaning sometimes the book is read, sometimes it's not. And we don't necessarily want to um, spread worry for things that are only read 50% of the time or 60% of the time. So the conditions, the, the um, variations that nurture screens for and reports on, these books are read like 95% of the time. That means if you have the variation, you are highly likely to have the condition. And, and so you, exp you explained to me about Wilms. So now you know that you have a high likelihood that you're... Yeah, Wilms is actually 99, 99. And so, so you do serial ultrasounds right. or MRIs? So exactly. So if you ended up, let's say you had your newborn or one-month-old screened and it came back with a high risk of Wilms for your output, as your pediatrician, I'd be like, holy crap. And I would begin doing ultrasounds. And because we have a team of geneticists and rare disease experts and in all areas, we would tell you when to start, what would the frequency be of those ultrasounds, and everything you'd need to know as a pediatrician. I'm not sure I can tell you that right now, but we would be, at the team, the nurture team, would be able to give that guidance. And so when they see the tumor, they go in and they just they right. They the take tumor. it out when it's the size of a pea, instead of waiting until you palpate it. Yeah, and the idea well, is by taking it out at a very small size, you can you can minimize the need for additional treatment and complications and all of that. Well, this and, may be a silly question. Yeah. But if this thing is so good to predict the future, why not just take the kidney out from the beginning before it develops into worms. Because it isn't more than two stems. It isn't 100%. Yeah. And, and what do you do when you don't have a kidney? How do you pee? No, you have another kidney. Well, you don't know which kidney it's going to come out on either. Oh, uh, okay. But that was that too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so this is fascinating because there's two things that you've touched upon. So autoimmune diabetes is polygenetic variable penetrance with an outside trigger that's probably an enterovirus, but could be something else. And no cure, but we do know that early treatment to prevent DKA, which may just be a conversation with the parents, improves the long-term outcome of these people, children, young adults affected with the disease. So one thing that has been talked about quite a bit is to do genetic testing and then only do autoantibodies on those children that have the right HLA types so that we're very focused on trying to see who is at risk very early on. 
The other one that's very interesting is I've yet to meet a mother who's had to find out that their child is going to live with T1D when they collapse on their waiting in, the, in their family room or in the PICU with DKA that does not say, why did my pediatrician not screen my kids? I would I think have wanted that's true to know. for any of these rare, all the rare disease parents say, I wish I'd known earlier. All the, I totally agree with you, Herb, on that. Everybody wishes they had known earlier, right? And had, had the opportunity to, even if you can't intervene to, in the case of diabetes now, we can intervene to either delay onset or to reduce severity of onset, right? The severity of the initial presentation, even if, even if you, even if that weren't possible, right? Just knowing that you can change disease trajectory through early intervention allows a parent to be feeling as though they are in the driver's seat. It gives them a plan. And I'm not saying that there isn't a sense of, like, you grieve that loss of your normal child uh, upon discovery of this information. And because you are also given hand in hand with that information, a plan, it relieves that grief in a way. But I, if it were only the information, it would be cruel. But because it is delivered with a plan, it, the day, there's actually been good data looking at it. People are relieved in the long, in that way, and happy to receive it. Now, I have a, a question here. Medically, I understand this, but what do you do with, you have a kid that you do a test on, and he's going to get Wilms tumor sometime in the future. Who knows when, or diabetes, or whatever disease you're testing for. Now, this kid is uninsurable in the future for the rest of his life. No, he's not. So unless the ACA gets... Yeah, but if he has stability, he cannot get mm. life insurance. Mm -hmm. He'll have a pre-existing condition for health insurance. So the way I look at it is this. He's going to get the condition. Yeah. He's going to... That's going to be true no matter what. Say, I'm sorry, I can't. You're uninsurable. And he you're, would be uninsurable once he got Wilms tumor, once he got diabetes. But you don't know when. So he, maybe they'll get their, their insurance before they get the problem. But so do you tell every newborn, go get disability and life insurance for your child? No, so there's a chance they're going to get diabetes or Wilms tumor? We have, we try to get a long term disability insurance for our physicians. And we had a physician that had one of these rheumatological illnesses, not sick. No, I get it. But my point is, is that I, un I understand, but because nurture doesn't screen for adult onset conditions, it only screams for early childhood conditions. Right. You're not going to be in that quandary. We're not looking for BRCA. We're not looking for Parkinson's. We're not looking for honey. We're not looking for adult onset conditions. So all of these will have presented mm -hmm. by Those eight, are. nine years old. So it's not the only alternative is to tell parents. Get life and disability insurance. You can't get disability insurance for a three-year-old. You know what I mean? It just can't. You can't get life insurance for a three-year-old, but realistically, they're going to have the condition. It's going to be a part of their life no matter what. But I wonder, do the, these insurance companies, do they have access to that information? They seem to get access to everything. I think that, I think they would. I think you have to disclose it anyway if you are making application because if you don't disclose it and then something happens, you will be, you will avoid the policy. So I think that it would be important to disclose. But I think my point, George, is that from a functional standpoint, it's irrelevant yeah. because the conditions are so highly penetrant yeah. that by the time the person is actually getting life and disability insurance, we will already have it and we'll have to report it regardless.
Yes. It doesn't matter. It's, it's no different than you can't get homeowners insurance in certain areas of the country because of the amount. Well, but of that's routines. a choice. No, I know, but yeah, if, that's, if your grandmother had that house, it, it become uninsurable because no one wants to, no one wants to go into the market. They leave the market. And as far as disability, they can disqualify you for disability because we went through a divorce and you became depressed and somebody wrote in the chart that you were depressed post-divorce and that's it. They don't want to insure you because you're a suicide risk right. and yeah. that's it. So no, we're never going to win that bottle. Insurance is about assessing risk and actuary tables. And if you fall but out I, of the norm, I agree with done. George about screening for adult onset conditions. And actually I discourage patients from screening for certain adult onset conditions because of that. Or I tell families, look, before we're going to do this for this adult onset condition, I want you to think about this issue. And if it isn't affecting your child's health and wellness right now, I think you should wait. And at the point at which they are, whether it's reproductive age or we need to know it for contraceptive use or whatever, then we will consider screening. So I agree with you, George. I'm not disagreeing at all, but I feel like for these particular conditions, because of the early onset of symptoms, it's not going to be as relevant. Now, Ma Molly, what do you think pediatrics will look like 10 to 15 years from now with all the different new, di I don't know if they're new diseases, but more predominant diseases that we're seeing now that infectious disease is gone. And ability yeah, in my to office this summer, I can tell you that. I've seen even pneumonia this year than I have I've seen in my practice life ever. But I agree with you. All this genetic call. stuff that we can do and all these yeah. wonderful therapies that we can start early on. And then it's all these immune modulators that we're using. Well, well what would it look like 10 or 15 years from now? I, I have my, I hope it looks like and what I think it will look like. I don't know about you guys, but my practice right now is a lot of mental health right now. And I'm hoping that as we become more knowledgeable about the biological, genetic, and family systems and social network, all the things around mental health, that that becomes less of, a, of an issue in 10 years. And although it's still always going to be a part of our practice because disease is disease, that it is less of a um, profound part of our practice. Uh, I do think there will be 10 years might be a little bit of a short timeline, but I do think that we will see more very personalized medicine, people having adults and children alike, having more understanding of how medications interact specifically with their metabolic personhood. And we already can do some of that with regard to mental health medications, especially SSRIs with pharmacogenetics, but I suspect we'll have even a better understanding of all that. I think the gut microbiome is going to become a major player in the way we manage infant colic and the way we manage eczema and food allergy prevention from starting from birth and moving forward. I think it's going to become a much bigger player in, in medical management going forward. And, and our understanding of it will become much more nuanced. It won't just be when things are out of whack, but it'll be a more proactive approach in our health understanding. I think the microbiome is going to be fascinating, not, not, not only in mental health, but metabolic disease, obesity, type 2 diabetes, allergic conditions. Yeah. We are, I think we're just, we're not even seeing the iceberg. We're just seeing the little I tippy agree. top. I agree. And, yeah, no, nobody's and looking going at the down. Data around yeah. colic in the gut microbiome is fascinating, actually. Looking at babies who are colicky at six weeks and looking at the adjustments and reduction in symptoms. And it's interesting just to see. So I think there is quite a bit we still have to learn. Looking at the reduction in food intolerances and allergy 
predilections. I think it's, I, I think there's a lot there. I think there's a lot there. And then we look at, if we look at mental health in particular, kids who have high processed food diets are more at risk for uh, mental health conditions like depression and anxiety. And of course, it's hard to, to weed out confounding variables, of course. Kids who have high processed diets are probably also in households that are a bit more stressful. They're less, they may be a little bit more chaotic or their parents might be a little bit more permissive because of the nature. If you're having that diet, who knows? But I also think that creates a gut microbiome that's different as well. And how does that all play in? We have to think about it in a variety of ways, but uh, I do wonder about its role in in promoting m mental health. And then I have one last final question, because we're taking a lot of your time today, but how do you think the lack of payment, and when I say pediatricians, I'm using that as a very broad word, because... We're a community. I can't be good at nutrition. I can't do cognitive behavioral therapy. I can treat some type 2D patients, but I can't really treat type 1D There's already in stage three that needs insulin. So I need a community that I can hand off or ask for support in some of these patients. And the community as a whole is not being paid to do the work they need to do. How do you think that has a negative impact? And, and it's no longer the Medicaid patient. It's also true of the commercially insured patients. Some of these plans pay worse than Medicaid in some markets. And you cannot get the help that these children need because there's no one that can afford to stay. I think that we're going to come to a reckoning in primary care as a whole. Pediatricians, of course, are at the lowest rung financially on that ladder of primary care, but we are not alone in our frustration with payment for the services we give. I think that part of the challenge, of course, is that as we advocate for ourselves and for the work that we do, the idea of being paid for, respected for, and for time and expertise and compassion is very different than a procedure which is much more concrete in its ability to be measured. So I think as a group, pediatricians need to consider developing KOIs for this type of work that are measurable. And I'm not talking about RVUs here. I'm talking about what does a compassionate, motivational interview-driven, extensive visit look, what does an output of that look like in order to drive reimbursement in the same way that a hip replacement here are the six elements of a hip replacement. What are those elements? How do we then deliver that care and justify its work and on something other than time? Because it may not take 45 minutes for me to deliver a very complex set of strategies to a family. So time, just like it may not take a, an experienced surgeon to do a hip, it may take six hours for an inexperienced surgeon and three hours for an experienced surgeon. Time shouldn't be the metric. Complexity needs to be the metric. So what are those things that determine that? And that's for us to. I guess that's outcomes. Say. One are the outcomes delivered. See, the well, outcomes though are not you know. totally in our hands. That's the other okay. challenge. And but whereas the and, and whereas the outcomes in a hip replacement are they've chosen to make the outcomes in their hands. So the outcomes are no infection after surgery. Right? They haven't chosen the outcome to be can walk well after surgery. Okay. So if we're going to choose outcomes, which I don't disagree with, George, we can't choose patient well-being as the outcome. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? We have to choose our outcomes wisely. So I think outcomes are very difficult because we're dealing with human beings and every person's different in multiple ways. 
and some are going to accept the flu shot, some are not, some are going to take the COVID shot, some are not. Some are going to listen when I go, your kid cannot continue to gain 30 pounds a year. It's not possible. What should we do about it? And they come back, the child loses 10 pounds. Just with that, others are like, no, he's okay. I can't, there's nothing I can do about it. So um, outcomes need to be what we can do. So we, we can, can fix, yeah. have conversations. We can offer things. We can, that's all we can do. Yeah. And so to me, I think the conversation starts with, we need to recruit the best into the specialty of pediatrics. That means that they have to be paid $350,000 a year. Fun. And I'm not ashamed to say that because that's what the average physician makes in the U.S. I agree and with if we, you. If we can't pay that, then we're not going to get the best because people can make a thousand. George and I are coughing and laughing because we would love to make that, wouldn't we, George? Wouldn't I that mean, be great? Let's make that every year. But, but there's lawyers making a thousand to two thousand five hundred dollars an hour. Right. Yeah. Okay. They, there's no one's ashamed of that. And then you have to limit the number of patients you can see in a day, because yes. it's about relationship building and time. Not yes. in the sense that every patient that take me forty five minutes, but I might have to read about this kid because I'm not familiar with his condition. I need that time. I can't be in a treadmill of volume seeing five right. patients an hour because then my quality stinks because I'm just running from room to room trying to get them out the door without making a mistake. Exactly. And so until we talk about minimum payment to attract the best of the best and limited number of patients a day so that we have the time to do the relationship building and do the thinking, we're not going to move the needle in any direction. And unfortunately, to my great frustration, that conversation barely ever happens. No one wants to talk about that. They want to talk about value-based medicine, which is an acronym for how do we cut down the cost of taking care of chronically ill people who are at the end of stage and not the investment that our youth needs to be able to be successful. I think pediatricians also, though, need to embrace the value of extenders more. And I don't mean, and I think that uh, pediatricians have been, they're happy to have a nurse practitioner or PA in their office doing work that way. And I think if we are going to be able to, in a short-term way, recruit more pediatricians, then I think we need to consider the value of the, the European model where quote unquote GPs see or see everybody, see the garden variety cases and pediatricians are specialists. And we see the nurse practitioners see all everybody typical. And then we have maybe eight patients a day Instead, who are the more challenging cases? And then we do get to spend more time with those patients. I, the only reason I would push back against that because that model is used in Latin America quite a bit. Yeah. And you don't need a nurse practitioner. Uh, a good nurse and a good nutritionist could do most well-child exams as long as everything is perfect. Child's gaining the right amount of weight. He's on the, on the right path on the growth curves. The ASQs are normal. Uh, and it, uh, an educator can tell them about the vaccine. But what happens in that system is that they becomes quickly a two tier system where the people with money see the pediatrician mm -hmm. and the people without money just get through a treadmill where there's just lots of volume of normality and here's your shot and go home and nothing else gets addressed. And because that's how the system's very efficient. And I think we have so much wealth in this country. We can do better for our children. But yes, I think we could have nutritionists. We could have a, a physical therapist do the six month and the 18 month exam on children to make sure that their tone is normal, their development is normal, that their diet is on site. And then again, before they go into school and maybe I don't need to see that child because there's no concerns. But right now, if we did that, we wouldn't get paid for it. Yeah. You know, we can't, and we can't find the extended people because they get paid so little, they go into other things. 
But also there is something to be in a general physician, pediatrician, family medicine, which is different than an extender. Extenders can work alongside you. Yes, they can consult with you if you have a problem. I agree with that. We do use them in our office. Yeah, we do too. But Bob Brown, who was the physician that I replaced back in 96, told me once, he said, in order to become a real pediatrician, you should be able to see in the sea of a hundred normal, the one that has Wilms tumor. Extenders can't do that. I am sorry. Yeah, I think, well, yeah, I think mine could, but I know what you mean. I highly doubt it because I see it all the time. Yeah, no, mine could for sure. She's honestly, she's been in practice with me for 25 years. It's oh, like, that's it. It's 25 years you're going to learn. Yes. But yeah. of the new ones. Yeah. Yeah. No, she could. Uh, well, I know which I agree with you. I think you're right. That, that if you I work with a neurosurgeon, I probably could become a neurosurgeon in 25 years. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. We're not talking about that. There, there's, we have to respect our own profession a little bit. And yeah. In a way, we're yeah. giving it away to 23-year-old extenders that really have no experience. Yeah. I think the nurse practitioner is the physician assistant. If they work for a super subspecialty, yeah. in 18 months, they're really good at it. If you're, all you do is round on neurosurgery patients mm -hmm. and do all the post-op care in the hospital for all neurosurgery patients, in 18 months, a smart person can learn the, the algorithm. Correct. But I, I don't uh, think I don't comes about her. They're allowed to, I'm doing this for a neurosurgeon these 18 months and I'm really good at it. And you know what? I just got bored with that. I want to do cardiothoracic. Next. I understand. They can That's change the problem. Mind. Yeah. But, but it's not so much so in acute care, whether it's emergency room or in the pediatrics office, because there's so many things, a fever could, is it never a fever? Yeah. A fever could just be influenza today. It could be strep tomorrow. It mm -hmm. could be Ray, the next day. Ray. It could be yeah. a drug reaction. And that becomes so much trickier. And I think I learned this very a long time ago in 89 in Chicago. The nurse practitioners that were in the NICU, they're very good at it. They, they have a limited disease. They have sepsis, jaundice, prematurity. See, that's about it. Yeah. That's about it. And they do that every day and a day and, and they're very closely supervised and the patient's not going home. And you can't teach if you're, if you have a very, if you were a general pediatrician doing a lot of type one diabetes, but doesn't happen anymore, you could definitely train a PA or a nurse practitioner and they could do a lot of the follow-ups and yes. you could work with them. It's asthma, same thing. It's just over and over again, education, doing the same thing, following these parameters. It's trickier when it's, here's a kid with a limp. What is it, a broken? Yeah, but see, theoretically, that patient would then be bumped to your schedule. Absolutely. And so if and you do that, point, if you do right. that's great. A right. lot of practices don't do that. We've taken a lot of your time. With, I could talk to you for another three hours. I could turn it into a Joe Rogan podcast, but. What? This month I'd be happy to have a conversation with you anytime, so. You're right. <laughs> But I got to catch a plan. You probably have to go see patients. Yeah. So thank you yeah. very much for your time. It's wonderful right. to see you again. And I'm yeah. hoping that I will be at Traverse City's uh, meeting next year. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Great. Thank All you right. so much. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks so much.